Well, welcome to another midweek Bible study. We thank you for joining us and we trust that the Lord will bless you and encourage you uh, with this little study together. Today we are going to do something that is going to be quite difficult, but I think we can do it. I'm going to do a little study on the entire character in the book of Nehemiah. So I've entitled this study, Nehemiah, Man on a Mission. So if you have your Bibles open to the book of Nehemiah, I'm just going to read the first 11 verses of the first chapter just to kick us off. And then we're going to kind of do a survey of this entire book and see what God has to teach us from this remarkable book. Nehemiah chapter 1, and I want to read verses 1 down to 11, which is basically the entire chapter. It says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with me from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and who had survived the captivity concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy and those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night. For the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant, Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you command your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter them among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you who were cast out to the farthest parts of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cup bearer. Well, setting the scene for us, we may be familiar with where the Jews and the Jewish nation is at this time. They've been taken away into captivity under the Babylonian Empire. Currently, in uh, Nehemiah's day, the Persian Empire has kind of come in and taken control of the region. And so the Jews are living in a place of exile. Their homeland, and particularly the city of Jerusalem, was in great distress and great disarray as they were shipped off into another place. Nehemiah is uh, the character we're looking at today, and we know a little bit about him from this text, notably that he was in a position of somewhat importance, but also in a position of danger. He was the king's cup bearer. What does that mean? Well, he Basically, he was in charge of bringing the king's wine to him and testing it before uh, it was brought to him. Just in case someone had decided to try and poison the king, it was his job to uh, make sure that it was safe before he brought it to the king. Uh, There were a lot of protocols and a lot of uh, things that he had to follow in, in this process of coming into the very presence of this king, which the Persians, many believed, was kind of an incarnate form of a god. And so Nehemiah was in this position, a Jewish man serving in the palace in an important yet dangerous position. Nehemiah uh, hears of a situation. He gets reports that his homeland, particularly the city of Jerusalem, is uh, in bad shape. The walls of the city have been broken down. And in, of course, those days, a walled city was, that's what protected Uh, the city from thieves and robbers and uh, people who would pillage and uh, destroy and and desecrate the city. And so this removed a lot of its protection. Nehemiah uh, was, of course, not the first to kind of hear of these reports or even return or take a bunch of people back to Jerusalem. Uh, Prior to him, Zerubbabel and Ezra had taken a group back to rebuild the temple. 
Um, and uh, they had done so um, and successfully done so, but now the city and the temple were under um, in danger. And so Nehemiah is a person, first of all, I want you to notice that he is a man of great concern. Uh, this is the kind of person that Nehemiah was. He was a man of great concern. When he heard the situation going on in Jerusalem, this really struck him. This really got to his heart. It says in verse 4 that when I heard these words that Jerusalem was in distress and reproach, the walls are broken down, the gates are burned with fire, that it caused him to weep, mourn, fast, and pray. The temple had been rebuilt about 15 years prior, and uh, I'm sure Nehemiah was expecting to hear good news from the region, wanting to hear of the blessing of God. However, the walls are down, the gates are burning, and this causes Nehemiah to come into a place of great distress. Now, the reason why this is so important is not just because Nehemiah just has some great affinity for his home country or city. We all have that in many ways. We don't like to see our country or our city that we belong to in a place of turmoil. But this goes even beyond that because, you see, to the Jew and to the world, Jerusalem was supposed to be a testimony and a testament to the faithfulness of God and to the character of God. It once shone as a beacon of the faithfulness of God to the nations around. The temple was a beacon of God's uh, presence there in Jerusalem. And so to see the city in such a state of disrepair hurt and, and burden Nehemiah because essentially it was a testimony to the reproach of his God. It demonstrated to the nations that the God of Israel uh, was not the all-powerful God, that he actually is. And so this burdened Nehemiah and it broke his heart it says that Nehemiah spent a time, uh, many months, many days anyway, fasting and praying. And we have a record of this prayer in chapter 1. You notice there in verse 5 that his prayer starts off with a declaration of God's goodness and character. He declares God to be the great and awesome God, the God who keeps covenant, the God who is merciful. And he declares these things to God. You know, that's how we ought to start praying declaring the faithfulness of God. Most of us start off with our prayers with petitions, don't we? Here's what I need. Here's what I'd like. Here's what I want. But well, it's good to have it to get into the practice of declaring to God his wonderful attributes. He then goes into a place of confession in verses 4 down to verse 7 when he confesses and admits the sins of not only himself but also his people. He comes humbly before God and acknowledges his desperate need for him. So Nehemiah petitions God to allow him to do something about the dire situation that is on his heart. Now again, this is going beyond far just a building project that he wants to accomplish, but this is directly connected to the work and the worship of God. And so here's a good uh, question for us. Is Nehemiah is a man of great concern about the spiritual estate and the spiritual affairs of God's people. Does this concern us? And if it does so, what does that drive us to? Does it drive us to fasting and prayer and contrition? I can't help but think over the last couple of months and the 18 months as we've seen uh, many impacts of our society and around us, that in many ways we've been driven to social media or to the internet or to um, all sorts of arguments, but have we been driven to our knees? Have we been so burdened by the spiritual affair of God's people in the church and the world around us that has driven us to a place of contrition. I know I haven't as much as I, I need to be, but this is Nehemiah's heart. So Nehemiah is, first of all, a man of great concern. The second thing we see about Nehemiah is not only that, but he's a man of commitment. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 6, and we're not going to read it, but this is the account that Nehemiah actually stands before the king and he's sad in the presence of the king. That's not a good thing to do. You're not supposed to be sad in the presence of the king. Matter of fact, it could even be punishable by death if he were sad in his presence. Yet Nehemiah is so burdened by what's going on that he comes to the king and he is sad. Thankfully, the king doesn't execute him, but he actually inquires about what is going on. And it's interesting to note, isn't there, in verse 4, the king said to me, what do you request? 
And notice this, so I prayed to the God of heaven. I think that was one of those quick silent prayers. You know those prayers we pray in silent when we're in trouble? You know, I don't think Nehemiah just excused himself and said, excuse me, let me pray. I think it was one of those quick offerings to God. And he said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah to the city of my father's tombs that I may rebuild it. Nehemiah was not just concerned, he was also committed. He wasn't just burdened, but he was willing to do what it took to rebuild that wall and to restore honor to the name of God. A lot of us are burdened about what's going on. A lot of us are burdened by the state of affairs in the church. A lot of us are burdened about the lostness of humanity. But does that burden carry us to the point where we will say, you know what, I will put my hand up and I will actually do something and commit to what God wants me to do. Nehemiah was a man of commitment. Now, Nehemiah, uh, these concerns that we have must be converted into commitment. This means stepping out in faith. For Nehemiah, this was an act of faith before the king. He had to trust that God would stir and move in the heart of the king to allow him to do this. He had to trust that God would raise up those who are needed to accomplish this great task and provide all the necessary means to accomplish this great task of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah is not only a man of great concern, a man of commitment, but he is a man who calls to action. He is a good leader. He is a man who has the ability to call others to come with him and accomplish this task. Verse 11 of chapter 2 says, So I came to Jerusalem, was there three days. He goes to inspect uh, what's going on. He says, I rose in the night and a few men with me. I told no one what God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. He says, I went out through the valley gate, through the refuse gate, viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down and the gates burned by fire. Then I went to the fountain gate and the king's pool. There was no room for the animal under me. So I went up by night to the valley and viewed the wall. And I turned back and entered by the valley gate. And the officials did not know where I had gone. And then verse 17, he says, I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good to me and also the king's word and he had, that he had spoken to me. And then he said, let us rise up and build. And they set their hands to do this good work. Nehemiah was a man who calls others to action. He had a purpose, but he also had a plan. Now he needed the people. And this leadership quality of Nehemiah is on full display. You see, anyone could have seen the problems. As a matter of fact, most of us are great at finding problems. Uh, we're really great at pointing out the problems in churches and in society. But what leaders do is they possess the ability not just to point out problems, but to find solutions and actually inspire people to the movement. And the response was one of unity and devotion. The people caught on and they said, let us rise up and build. We will give ourselves over to this task. And Nehemiah was a man who calls others to action. We also discover about Nehemiah is that he is also a man of unwavering conviction, unwavering conviction. Any work of God will bring with it hostile and fierce opposition. Satan and his minions and all the forces of darkness in this world are at war and at enmity with God. It actually should be expected that when God's work is being done, that there will be opposition to it. It should be expected because we are in a spiritual battle. Like all great works, this comes with opposition. For Nehemiah, this comes primarily with two people here. Verse 19, it says, But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they laughed at us and they despised us. And they said, What is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? And so I answered them and said to them, The God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. Sanballat and Tobiah, 
come around about seven times, they are recorded as trying to oppose or distract or deter the work of God. They were a thorn constantly in the side of Nehemiah and of God's people. Their tactics were malignant. They were determined. They were persistent. They laughed. They mocked. They accused. They threatened violence. And at one point in time, they tried to lure Nehemiah off the wall and to stop the work. In Nehemiah chapter 6, it says, Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, and Tobiah, the Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, although at the time I had not hung the doors on the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem said to me, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. A trap was set for Nehemiah. Come to the plains of Ono. And as someone once said, Nehemiah said, Oh no, to Ono. Oh that wasn't mine. I stole that from somebody else. Either way, the distractions, the deterrence, the oppositions, they began to pay people. They actually paid people to prophesy falsely against Nehemiah. They were determined. D.L. Moody says this, that if Satan allows our work to go unhindered, it is because our work is of no consequence. Brothers and sisters, let us always be mindful <clears throat> that as honorable and as good and as right as the work of God is and the preaching of the gospel and the restoring of uh, the honor of God in this world, that it will come with fierce opposition. But Nehemiah was a man of unwavering conviction. He would not come down. He would not give in. He didn't give them an inch. Not only is he a man of unwavering conviction, but Nehemiah is a man with outstanding character. He's a man of outstanding character. Fascinating chapter in, in Nehemiah chapter 5, and you can read it. I would encourage you to do so. As the people come back to Jerusalem, and there's a large number of people, thousands of Jews have been allowed to return and to rebuild the walls of the city. Nehemiah is kind of the, um, the uh, overseer of the building projects. Uh, he's kind of one taking the leadership in all of those things. But there was appointed governors uh, of the people in, uh, in Jerusalem at the time that were kind of overseeing the economy uh, and trade and, uh, I guess, politics in some ways uh, as this large group of people and society. You know, the sad thing is, and this was really sad, is that even though these people had been under years of oppression and, and bondage in uh, Babylon and now in Persia, when they come back to Jerusalem it's very evident that they bring that same mentality with them. Even though they had been an oppressed people, these governors who now are find themselves in a position of power have learned nothing, and they bring the exact same oppression with them. As a matter of fact, it gets so, so bad that because of the heavy taxes and burdens that these Jews place on their own brothers and sisters, it gets so bad that many of the Jewish people, in order to just pay the taxes, had to mortgage lands, they had to sell their daughters uh, and sons into, into forms of slavery. Now, it's not like sex slavery or anything like that, but in terms of servitude and other families just to provide. The governors were taking so much for themselves, giving little back to the people. They were selfish and they were cruel. Nehemiah comes along to them. And he rebukes them. Verse 6 of chapter 5, he says, I became very angry when I heard the outcry and these words. And after serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said to them, Each of you is exacting usury or taxes from your brother. So I called a great assembly to them and I said to them, According to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold out to the nations. Now indeed, will you even sell your brethren or should they be sold out? It says they were silent. They were being rebuked by a good and faithful leader. Nehemiah is eventually appointed as the governor. So not only is he kind of the uh, managing director of the building project, now he's the governor. And as governor of the people, Nehemiah relieves the burdens from them. He doesn't overtax them. As a matter of fact, he even denies himself certain privileges as governor 
for the sake of not burdening the people. And it says he does so in verse 15, for the sake of the fear of God. What a leader this guy was. Not only was he able to inspire and rally people to accomplish great work for God, but he was a godly leader and a faithful example. And you know that that is what is required of our leaders. You know, if our leaders would govern under the fear of God, and I know that's kind of a stretch for us to even almost ask of, but that's true. If you govern under the fear of God, this will produce a type of leadership which is compassionate, which is just, which is equitable, and which is fair. And in verse 18, he says, I did not even demand the governor's provision because the bondage was heavy on the people. Remember me, my God, for good, according to all I have done. Nehemiah was a man of outstanding character. You might be in a position of leadership in your church, in your company. Uh, you are, if you're a parent, in a position of leadership in your home. How do you lead? How do you govern? Do you place extra burdens upon people? Do you take for yourself and make decisions based upon your own personal gain or for the sake of the good of others. Nehemiah did so because of the fear of God, because he did not want to be an unjust ruler. Sixthly, Nehemiah was a man who sees things through to completion. Chapter six, verses 15 to 19, record for us that the wall was finished in 52 days. What a feat of rebuilding a city wall in 52 days. Wow, a miraculous effort by God's people to clear rubble, rebuild an entire city wall in 52 days. Obviously, they'd have to deal with council approvals and, and uh, environmental protection laws and all of these types of things that we have to deal with. Nevertheless, still a massive feat. Good leaders see things through to completion. Starting things is easy. We all know that. Starting projects is easy. Seeing things through to completion is very difficult. They push through the opposition. They get things done. Nehemiah organized the people, assigned them tasks, protected them from harm, encouraged their hearts when they were discouraged, and they worked together to finish the job. Nehemiah saw this through to completion. And then lastly, he is a man who will not compromise. Chapter 8, verses 1 to 12, record for us when Ezra, the scribe, and we're familiar with him from another book of the Bible, but he brings out the law of Moses and he reads to the people. And then in verse 10, it's a fascinating statement there in verse, uh, in verse 10 of chapter 8, it says, and they said to him, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send proportions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is the holy day to the Lord. Do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your strength. They celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles after, after feasting on God's word. They rejoice with one another. Then in chapter nine, the Bible says that these people confess their sins before God. In chapter 10, verses 28 to 31, after Nehemiah goes through and essentially cleanses the land uh, and cleanses the people of their sin and sacrifices are made, they make a covenant with God and a promise with God that they will obey him. Nehemiah is a man who will not compromise. He is a great leader and a great example to us. This is a good question for us. Is this the type of person that we are? Are we burdened by the state of affairs in God's kingdom? Does this burden translate into a commitment to serve, to do our part? It may not be the part of leadership like Nehemiah. You may just be one of the people on the wall, but all of that is necessary. Are you a man or a woman of great conviction who will not come down regardless of who comes along and tells you that you should? Will you stay true and see things through to completion, to finish the work that God calls you to do? We know that in some ways the work of God is never finished until Christ finishes it, and he brings all of this time to completion. Nevertheless, we stay faithful to the end. As I read this, though, I couldn't help but recognize how much in many ways it's in some ways a picture of the life of Christ. Christ came out of love. He was committed to going to the cross in full cooperation between the Father and Son in complete 
the miraculous work of redemption. And he is still completing that work as every single person whom he has redeemed is coming into his sheepfold. The perseverance of Jesus amidst satanic opposition all along the way on earth is there for all to, to see. And he saw the work of complete, uh, completed on the cross. You know, there was even, I read this morning in my devotions in Matthew chapter 27 and 28, that even as he was on the cross, people came by and they said to him, come down off that cross. If you're the son of God, come down. Kind of like how Sanballat and Tobiah tried to get Nehemiah to come away from the wall and go down to the plain of Ono. But I am grateful that Jesus didn't come down off that cross, that he finished the work that God called him to do. Jesus is actually the real man on the mission. And he is accomplishing that mission and he will see it through to completion. And he will not give his honor to anyone else. May we take this example of Nehemiah and of course of the Lord Jesus Christ and apply it to our lives. 